From brand experience stores in malls to pop-up stores and city showrooms, from mobile service to remote service over the air, um, this is a vibrant, vibrant, diverse time for formats across sales and after sales. And this is something we'll be talking about with my guest today, Dirk Adelman from Smart and Andrea Sorrenti from MSX. So Andrea, let me start with you this time, uh, building on what you said previously, with all of these different retail formats, it's such a fantastic opportunity for us to reimagine the customer experience. Uh, in your experience, how are brands, both traditional and disruptive brands, approaching the topic of customer experience with all of the tools and formats available at their disposal today? Well, first, I think brands are realizing that this is really the essence of, um, of their relationship with the consumers, right? It's, uh, it's not only about the product, but it, it's how you experience the product. And so that goes from, again, the moment you interact with it online and you start researching it to, to the moment you experience it in person and then you go through the purchase and, uh, and, and after that, the, the service process. So um, uh, that, that's where the integration that we, we discussed previously is, is extremely important. Um, I would say the key to making sure that that experience is uh, is frictionless is is data, mm. um, and this is an important topic for the industry right now. Uh, we've uh, at length we've seen how there was a little bit of conflict between the dealer who mm. thought, "Hey, this customer is my customer. That that customer data is is my data," and the OEM that that really wanted to make sure that that customer was being catered for and, and taken care of, and that they didn't see that fragmentation where mm. they were contacted by, by different individuals. So um, I think that's really one of the key elements in the customer experience. If we look at brands even outside of automotive that, that are uh, excelling in that field, it's, it's really about knowing who you are as an individual, understanding what your needs are gonna be and, and being able to address those. Mm -hmm. um, Dirk, with this, with this uh, diverse landscape of, of retail formats, both on the sales and after sales side, we recognize that each format plays its own unique role, right? A, a large uh, dealership, especially in, in places like North America where, you know, cars and stock are in a large yard or, or parking lot and people go and, as they say, kick the tires and buy a specific unit that is in stock. Um, and, and those formats play a role there versus you know, uh, city stores or, or mall stores in locations where there's a high throughput of traffic and a lot of footfall. All of these play their own sort of roles uh, in, in the mix, right? But from a brand's perspective, it is very important to get the mix right. Mm -hmm. So I want to learn from you. We, we want to hear from you as smart. How did you approach uh, the, the question of getting the mix right? And, and what are some of the formats you have deployed or have experimented with? Mm -hmm. Um, I would say our backbone is our um, shop-in-shop, fully integrated smart uh, retail format. And this is a two, three vehicle format. And we could only do uh, such a small format within the smart and the Mercedes-Benz organization in Europe because we, from the very beginning, um, designed our business model and product um, in a very simplistic way. So make it easy for the customer to, to choose. So within five clicks, uh, you can buy your car online, mm. which means um, the only thing you need to choose is the color, the trim line, um, engine and the line, and that's it. And mm. then you basically can uh, order cash buy or leasing. That's the mm. fifth click. Mm. Um, if you have it like this, you don't need 20, 30, 40 cars in a, in a showroom or in a, in a 4S dealership mm. on display because it's very easy to, to imagine the different colors, um, the, the different trim lines you can also showcase in the uh, showroom. So you can do that, very small, very, very lean um, setup or format, uh, only if the model and the model lineup, the product lineup is allowing it. Right. So not a lot of special options, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the smart way of doing it. We, we do have standalone showrooms um, in very prominent metropolitan areas, like in Paris, um, Trocadero, 
um, a showroom that a lot of brands envy us for. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful for our investor over there that he is a real brand maniac. So he grew up with Smart and he loves Smart. So he will hopefully uh, never sell. Mm. Um, we have those um, standalone stores as well, but very limited and only in metropolitan areas. In the UK, we are experimenting with uh, shopping mall formats, mm. which is working nicely. Mm. Again, if you um, add the test drive element to it, because mm. just shopping mall traffic, etc., is nice, but convincing the people to buy means test drive in a battery electric mm. uh, vehicle mm. environment. So, on the sales side, those are the three major formats um, uh, we use. Mm. Uh, mm. After sales side, um, we are linked with Mercedes-Benz in Europe. So wherever there is a service factory or a battery remanufacturing um, uh, outlet, which is then run by the OEM, for example, um, we are in that uh, too. Mm. So we are using the big uh, toolbox that our um, German mother is uh, providing on the after sale side. Um, I know we spoke about very briefly about Omnichannel previously in our, in our conversation, uh, but I think this is the right time to bring that up because the fact that different formats exist mm. Uh, I think further complicates the the omnichannel um, orchestrating the omnichannel experience. So not only are we now talking about giving the customer a seamless experience between an online and offline medium, but we are also talking about orchestrating a seamless experience between different retail formats. Now, in our experience, there have been the most success has been found when a customer can experience the brand at a brand store, and then maybe a few weeks down the line land up at a pop-up store and take a test drive uh, and then maybe a few days down the line walk into a dealership, trade their existing car, look at lease offers and so on and so forth. And at each step in the process, if we are able to orchestrate a, a, a customer journey or a customer experience that's seamless where they don't start from scratch at each format or, or in each episode, uh, I think that's what makes the customer experience uh, really unique and really memorable. So from Smart's perspective, how have you orchestrated this? Uh, what sort of, obviously the technology backbone and landscape is very critical. So what sort of technology landscape and, and what sort of uh, people and, and process and cultural element makes this possible? I think two main elements. Uh, one is, as you rightly said, the software. Uh, we have done a nine months pitch on what we use and we have selected a CRM software, Salesforce, mm. I think it's okay to mention, um, for sales and after sales combined. Mm. Uh, so for our retailers, but also for our call center and for us here in, in the European headquarter. And that's for the very first time that everybody is using the same software. Mm. Uh, everybody is using the same system. And we are now trying to connect the dealer management systems, the DMSs um, of this world um, to that uh, system so that you don't have to double entry because otherwise nobody is working with it. Mm. So that's the very first element. The second part um, of the equation is the network. Uh, we have restructured our network um, right from the beginning, so five years ago, and we have now much bigger market areas per retailer group. So that means uh, even if you go to different formats, it's one group. Mm. So the transition from customer uh, between the formats is much easier if you don't have to not only jump format, but also jump uh, retailer uh, groups. So mm. this is the second element, um, at least in, in, uh, in our setup, that helps us um, have the journey smoothened a little bit on the mm. um, offline mm. side. Mm. So it's the technology and the network and, and the coming together of both those elements that actually yeah. orchestrates this kind of customer experience for your customers. Um, now, Andrea, we've spoken so many times about how vibrant this environment is and the fact that really the sky is the limit for brands when it comes to experimenting with different formats and what works and what not. So uh, in your experience working with uh, brands and OEMs, do you see a sort of approach to experimentation or a, or a playbook to experimentation emerging? And, and, and do you see a, a sort of framework where uh, they might establish uh, some outcomes that they desire and then go through a process of determining whether those outcomes have been achieved or not. And if not, then fail fast, fail quick, move to something yes, else. Uh, yes, I think so, definitely. But but that remains probably one of the biggest challenges in the industry, mm -hmm. right? The, the agility of um, some of the legacy organizations uh, is is a huge challenge. You know, they need to be able to shift quickly, um, experiment, and to your point, fail fast and move on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not always easy when you're, when you're, you know, your your ship is so big and so mm -hmm. difficult to to turn. 
smaller companies, uh, the disruptors are, are probably um, more at ease in, in that environment. Is there a playbook that works for all? Definitely not. Um, you're probably not going to be selling a super premium vehicle in, uh, in a mall. Mm. Um, but, um, you know, at the same time, that is where you're going to attract a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of traffic. So I, I think each brand will have to adapt to their, uh, to their unique situation. And regions play a key role in that as well, because cultures are different across the regions. Mm. Um, there's, uh, you know, you, you go to the U.S., for example, the, that instant gratification of driving away with a vehicle that's sitting on the lot is still there. So are they going to be able to be successful with some of the um, more, uh, again, some of those leaner showrooms that we're talking about in Europe? Maybe not as much. Mm. Um, and so we'll we'll uh, we'll have to um, we'll have to see closely what works mm. best. Um, yeah, I, I hate to use cliches, but uh, one of the cliches that is often mentioned is that uh, uh, at least for certain markets, it's uh, easier to go to the dentist for a tooth extraction that's less painful than than buying a new car. Um, I'm sure things have changed in the last few years since uh, this survey was done. Um, but uh, uh, Andrea. What can we learn? What can the industry learn from innovations in other retail categories, which may be a little more innovative, recognizing that our what we are selling is is quite unique. It's a, a high involvement, uh, high risk purchase, and so uh, that that impacts the consumer behavior and the purchase process. But even then, what is it that we can learn from? innovations in other retail categories that we might be able to bring into our industry? Well, again, it's, it's that frictionless experience that we talked about. Um, given that we're talking about a high investment for a family, there needs to be um, a, a number of steps that you need to undergo uh, you know, from, from validating credit and making sure that that customer is able to, to pay for that vehicle and, and going through a, a number of approvals, insurance, and all of those connections <clears throat> excuse me, that are essential for us to go through that process successfully. Um, I think we've made strides. Digital retailing has been a topic that has been top of mind for the industry for a long time. In particular, in some regions, it's, it's greatly accelerated. Um, I can talk about my own experience. Um, I, uh, I recently bought a car in a dealership. I live in the U.S., so I'm afraid it was not a smart vehicle. When you guys decide to come over there, obviously, uh, that will be our depends number on one the target. regulatory environment, obviously. Yeah. Um, but we got in and out of the dealership in uh, in an hour mm. with uh, with a new car, mm. and um, it was quite seamless. Um, we test drove the car um, and and went through all the administrative uh, tasks very quickly. And I think a lot of dealers are aligning to that. Um, it's, it's not just the dealership though. There's also a, a, a framework, a regulatory framework that, that needs to adapt to make sure that that happens. I think we're moving in the right direction. Um, what will be interesting though is, um, again, there's, there's a lot of debate. If, uh, if I look back um, a few months, I remember Jim Farley, uh, the CEO of Ford, talking about how he was trying to um, shift a lot of the purchase process to order um, ordering vehicles that are not on the lot, mm. right? And and he he said this build to order his his objective was increasing it significantly. Mm. Um, we'll have to see if if that's the directions that consumer take the mm. consumer takes in the U.S. as well. So moving a little closer to the European model, or whether competition is going to drive the opposite in Europe as well. Mm. So whether um, you know delivery times are going to have to shrink, the sales process is going to have to become quicker and uh, and more effective. Um, I think probably there's a, a middle ground that, that we're going to reach um, across the the various regions, um, and that's certainly going to impact the way we we interact with the customer. And, and again, we go about the digital re retailing piece. I think one thing of note, which which I I always remind myself, you know, it's it's easy to get frustrated sometimes with what one might perceive as a very clunky purchase process. But I think it's uh, it we would be remiss if we don't remind ourselves of the fact that this tends to be a fairly complex purchase process, even though on a sheet of paper it it appears like six boxes. But the reality is that it's not just the brand and the dealer. There's there's a whole ecosystem of financiers and, and insurance providers. And 
for it to really be a, a seamless, smooth customer experience where you walk in, you test drive, and you walk out within a matter of minutes, there is a lot of orchestration that has to happen at the back end. There have to be a lot of systems connecting and, and talking to each other. The good news is that uh, that modern technology and architectures make this possible with, with APIs and, and systems connecting to each other. Um, but the reality on the ground is that this is a, a fairly challenging endeavor. So um, I think just something to be mindful of, mm. that this is a very complex environment with a number of different stakeholders that can tend to enhance or amplify that, that complexity quite yeah. a bit. Along the same lines, you're, you're not going to buy a house in, in one hour, yeah. right? And, um, and I think you're probably going to be able to buy a car in one hour, but not in one minute. Mm. Mm. Maybe in, in five clicks. Mm -hmm. In five clicks way. if you go cash buy. Yeah. Because exactly as you said, um, once you go into a leasing journey, yes. uh, once you want an insurance on top, once you are thinking about service contract extension, yes it gets more and more and more and it's different partners involved yes. and um, it took us two years to get our um, exclusive leasing partner Avens um, fully integrated into our journey but still you need the credit check mm. uh, you need um, uh, identification yes. uh, it's it's a long journey yes we could be spending a lot of time talking about just this aspect but mm. but we can't we've got to move on uh, Dirk I want to ask you from the perspective of innovation Share with us some unique, innovative things Smart has done uh, when it comes to retail formats. Uh, what did you try? How did you evaluate if it works mm. or not? And what did you learn from it? Well, let me go back 25 years, 26 years, um, actually. Um, Smart was the very first one that came up with uh, using storage mm. as kind of a display. You might recall the Smart Towers that we had. No? Mm with the four twos in there and you had a very fancy elevator getting your car down when you want to buy it. Um, that was quite an innovation uh, because um, instead of uh, not renting a yard, instead of building underground, we said this is our stock on mm -hmm. display so that everybody that drives by can see it. Um, for, for me, that was um, yeah one of the reasons why I, 26 years back, joined Smart for the first time. Mm -hmm. Uh, because they really tried something uh, something new and smart those days was the very first OEM uh, going into a direct sales model. Mm. Most people have forgotten. Um, that changed <laughs> um, in, uh, I think, three, three years later, but that was also super, super um, innovative mm. um, uh, those days already. Mm. Um, what, what we try to do, um, be less innovative on what works, but look into areas like um, subscription model like car sharing, um, what can we do on top of the classical B2C, B2B business model that we have where the people get into the showrooms, but can, can we reach out to them on different platforms, different formats, so to say, um, and can we grab their attention outside our showrooms? Can we partner up with um, subscription model companies, for example? Um, can we have kind of a test drive um, rally uh, with those partners in uh, bigger metropolitan areas? So you don't need a physical showroom, you just have a pop-up store. Mm. Uh, we were one of the first companies um, to have mobile uh, showrooms. So wherever, because we have a very lean uh, network setup, mm. wherever there is a, a gap or where we, wherever we think, let's experiment, have a showroom there as well, try it out uh, in a shopping mall, outside shopping mall on the yard, we do three months temporary showroom. Uh, and that format is half a day built up, half a day dismantled. Uh, and that's what, what we experiment with before we decide this is a point where we need to open a shop in shop, for example, or a standalone showroom. So, so that is something where we experiment a lot and are also super, super innovative in, in my eyes still. Yeah. One of the things I find most fascinating is that um, there is so much changing so quickly uh, and we are going to continue the conversation as we delve deeper into what this means for the business of a brand and an OEM and what it means for the business of business model of their network.